the American dream. It's the belief that anyone who makes an honest effort has the opportunity to succeed and prosper. Many work hard to achieve this goal, while some find ways to cheat the system in order to get rich quick. This was the case in the 1920s, when one man would create an elaborate plot that would damage lives and dash the hopes of those who entrusted him with their life savings. Charles Ponzi moved to the shores of Boston, Massachusetts in 1903, with only $2.50 to his name. For years, he toiled at odd jobs all over New England. He first worked as a restaurant waiter, but was eventually fired for shortchanging his customers. Then, Ponzi tried his luck in Montreal, Canada, where he found a job at a bank and worked his way up to become a bank manager. But once again, he got himself into trouble after he wrote a check to himself from another man's checkbook. Ponzi would serve three years in prison before returning to the United States. But as soon as he arrived, he found himself thrown in jail again after he was caught smuggling Italian immigrants. After his second stint in the slammer, Ponzi received a letter in the mail that would present him with yet another opportunity to take advantage of the system. The letter had come from Spain and contained an international reply coupon. This coupon was designed so that the recipient of international mail could buy a stamp for their reply. But Ponzi figured out that Italian stamps were cheaper than American stamps and that a small profit could be made. He thought he would simply go to the post office and cash in the IRCs. So he sent money to his relatives back in Italy to mail him some more. There were unexpected setbacks as the coupons couldn't be redeemed, but this didn't stop him from convincing potential investors that his idea was profitable. And thus Ponzi's plan was set in motion. In 1919, he began his new business, the Securities Exchange Company, and investors started lining up. Word spread quickly that Ponzi's company could yield very lucrative returns. He promised to double their money in less than 90 days. People were handing over their life savings and mortgaging their homes, and they were reaping fabulous returns. But instead of cashing out, they continued to invest in Ponzi's urging, which meant that he didn't have to pay out any dividends. Banks that had turned him down for loans the year before were now begging for him to become their client. His fledgling company soon expanded across New England, and Ponzi was becoming very wealthy. By March of 1920, he had earned $30,000, and just two months later, he made an astounding $420,000, which would be worth millions today. Almost overnight, Ponzi had become a millionaire, and the Securities Exchange Company was now a major success. But not everyone was convinced that Ponzi was operating within the law. In fact, some were growing suspicious. That July, a man filed a million dollar lawsuit, which caught the attention of the Boston Post. The Post then began publishing articles, questioning how his company could make such remarkable financial gains. To investigate Ponzi's company, they hired Clarence Barron, a well-known financial analyst and owner of the Wall Street Journal. Barron found that Ponzi would require 160 million coupons to raise the cash required to support his business. But there were only 27,000 coupons that existed in the entire world. The number of stamps needed to earn the staggering sum of money that Ponzi was making was nowhere near the amount that was actually in circulation. In fact, he discovered that Ponzi wasn't even invested in his own million dollar company. To offset this negative press, Ponzi hired William McMasters as his publicity agent, but soon enough, his plan would backfire. McMasters discovered incriminating evidence about Ponzi's company, and instead of handling the situation on Ponzi's behalf, he renounced his client and brought his findings to the Post. The, the, the man is a financial idiot. He sits with his feet up on his desk, smoking expensive cigars in a diamond holder, and talking complete gibberish about postal coupons. The investigation revealed that his new investor's money was being used to pay dividends to his original investors and not from his alleged profits. And it was also discovered that Ponzi was now over $7 million in debt. The racket was exposed on the front page of the Post on August 11th. And on August 12, 1920, Charles Ponzi surrendered to federal authorities and was charged with 86 counts of mail fraud. He had lost an astounding $20 million and was responsible 
after the collapse of six banks. After everything was said and done, a final audit of the business turned up a mere $61 worth of coupons. The world had learned a very expensive lesson, and it became known as the Ponzi scheme. Which is why it's always wise to remember that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is.